Haiti, Trinidad, and Tobago, is a first-generation Caribbean-American interdisciplinary artist and educator based in Jersey City, New Jersey. Through performance, found object, sculpture, mixed-media drawing, painting, video, photo, and writing, Nugin deepens his knowledge of historical and present-day conditions of black African descendants in the diaspora. Trauma, spiritual practices, language, memory, architecture, landscape, and climate change are primary concerns in his practice. Nugent holds a BA um, in Fine Art from Seton Hall University and an MFA from the School of Art Institute of Chicago. His work has been presented at the Museum of Latin American Art, Perez Art Museum, Museum of Cultural History, Norway, Norway Black Theater, Norway, um, the New York Museum, and many, many more. And I'm so excited to be joined here today by Newton. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, in, in having the ability to become better acquainted with your work and doing an enormous amount of digging and, you know, watching this full breadth of information and content that you have available online, one of the things that I was really taken aback by um, with your work is its sense of playfulness, its, its sense of ingenuity, um, its use of sort of found objects, um, its use of found objects um, to create this sort of like whimsical visual language. And, uh, you know, we spoke briefly about this when I, when I visited you at your studio. There's this really fascinating duality in your work with its inherent use of this fun, exciting, tactile, um, almost sense of play that it that it beholds, but it also is is reminiscent and is an explanation of this deeper kind of dark commentary on the need for innovation and ingenuity and the use of found objects and what that means for the people who create and take and build things out of nothing and, and where that need comes from. Um, so I'm so excited to get into this conversation today and I'm going to ask you the first question that I ask everyone, uh, which is, can you describe yourself as an artist? What do you do? Ooh. <clears throat> so uh, once again, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, to share in the exchange. Um, and hopefully, since we have a smaller group, especially we can have a, a robust uh, dialogue, right? Um, so <clears throat> I'm an interdisciplinary artist. Um, I have, um, my practice has evolved over time. Um, as an undergraduate student, I was really primarily focused on painting. And um, that was, you know, from, you know, just thinking and growing up thinking like, okay, I'm interested in art, like, what do we do? I have an opportunity to take a, an art class in, in college and I take a painting class. And that's, mm -hmm. how, that, that's what really started it all. Mm -hmm. um, and over the years, <clears throat> my interest in, in different types of materials, um, my, um, the fact that, you know, as, a, as, a, as an artist that was just starting out, I was just painting on anything that I could find. Um, so I didn't have to pay for things, didn't have really like, you know, money to be able to buy like canvas and that kind of thing. So I ended up painting on things like doors and um, other types of other fabrics and mm. things like that. So over time, the, the process has evolved to incorporating other types of mediums as a way to um, get closer to the ideas that I'm thinking about and, and things that I want to convey and questions that I want to ask through my work. Yeah. So uh, can you tell me a little bit, just to get some background started, can you tell me a little bit about your background and your early life? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> how far back do you want to go? <laughs> I mean, I guess, as, I guess as far, you know, we had that mention of that, like, you know, the, the multiple countries listed in your yeah. bio. Can you give a brief yeah. explanation on that? Yeah. So I'm a uh, first generation Caribbean American. Um, my mom is from Trinidad and Tobago. My father is from Haiti. And um, I was born in Jersey City. And the you know, life circumstances, I ended up going, my brother and I ended up going to Trinidad to live there for the early part of our childhood. Mm. And then coming back to the U.S. Um, at the age of nine. And that was um, kind of like this kind of period where I've had like my formative years growing up there. Yeah. And then coming to the United States and just having to kind of readjust at that, at that age. Yeah. You know? um, and yeah, and so Jersey City has been my, my permanent residence, and, mm -hmm. but since then have moved to different places, whether it's for like high school, went to a boarding school in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and then go, coming back to New Jersey for, um, for undergrad university, and then mm -hmm. uh, doing my MFA um, back and forth to Chicago as well, too. Wow, that's a lot of moving around. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, 
I wonder if that will be looped back into some of the other things we're about to get into with your with your interest in travel. Um, so, in your youth, were you interested in art? You know, you just you just shared that you found um, this sort of uh, interest when you were in college. But were you interested, or surrounded by, or had that experience mm -hmm. of art throughout all of those travels when you were younger? Mm -hmm. So it's like one of the things that you and I were talking about in the studio is like not until later on in life that I realized like the impact of my the built environment the environment that I grew up in Trinidad how it how it influenced my work at mm. this stage and that is um, in the way that like everything around well, so many things around were built by hand yeah and whether that was you know with like extreme care and craftsmanship my grandfather was a cabinet maker he built some of the furniture in our home mm. um, and my uncles carved wood for fun um, and and then you also have things like where my grandmom raised chickens, and in order to build the chicken coop in the back, it was really just getting somebody that's local, that knows how to put things together, and they're using found materials and found objects in order to construct this. Yeah. And later on in life, as, I, you know, as far as my, my career is concerned, I started to realize and see the connections back to that kind of visual vocabulary within the landscape. Um, so that was a, a huge impact. And then also to my mom taking my brother and I to all different types of artistic events like going to African dance, going to uh, drumming, going to um, ballet, going to different types of festivals and theater mm. productions and things like that, museums, galleries. My mom having a lot of friends who were artists as well. Yeah. So that definitely was um, played a big part in in my growing up becoming more interested in art yeah. and seeing it as a possibility. Absolutely, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Having that visual representation of the fact that like you can use your ingenuity and your creativity mm -hmm. to you know, whether it is being a person who builds chicken coops out of whatever's available, mm -hmm. or being a person who is a, you know, a full-blown artist or yep. a musician. Um, interesting. Can you, so, you know, I, I mentioned in your bio that you have a long list of things that you practice in. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just give us a general, like, explanation of each of the ones? You know, like, mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you really do? Because we're going to be focusing on something kind of specific today. Yeah. So, as an interdisciplinary artist, I look at different forms of art and, and saying like interdisciplinary meaning like thinking about like painting as a discipline, video as a discipline, um, performance art as a discipline. So in the way that I see interdisciplinary, I'm constantly thinking about those themes that you mentioned in, in the bio, mm -hmm. um, but exploring them through different mediums. Mm -hmm. So when I think about the different disciplines, I think of them as different languages. Mm. And just like if there's someone who speaks multiple languages, sometimes in order to really get to the core of what they're trying to say or what they want to express, they have to jump to another language, right? Um, so this is how I, I view my discipline. So if I have a particular theme or a particular idea that I'm, I'm working through, I might say, uh-huh, um, I'm going to do that through performance. Yeah. Um, or I might make a painting about this, this particular subject matter. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So, so we have performance. Is there anything on that list that I didn't, you know, you, know, you also work in the photographic medium. Mm -hmm. um, you also work in, can you talk a little bit about uh, just a touch on like the sculpture work, for example, like the pieces that we mm -hmm. have in through here? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm also always trying to figure out how to push the, the, the materials and push the ideas um, into, uh, kind of mediums or formats that are foreign to me. Mm, yeah. Um, it keeps things interesting. It helps me to be able, once I understand a, a different type of um, material a little bit better, then I'm also able to put that into my tool belt to be able to um, utilize it in other, in other places. Yeah. So these are prototypes for um, uh, sculptures, modular uh, sculptures that are from the series, the Bundle House sculptures, and we'll, we'll talk about Bundle House a little yeah. bit. But these are just, um, these are ways of me thinking through um, ways that I can give agency to a collector to be able to construct the bundle house in the way that they see fit. Mm. Wow, okay. Um, so the main thing that I wanted to speak to Nujun about today, because he has such a broad, such a long list and such a vast collection of different mediums that he works in, different conversations that could be had, I chose to focus on his collage work, um, in essence, which is many, many things. So that's kind of what we'll be touching on uh, predominantly through like the second half of our conversation, and a lot of which you guys are probably seeing up and through here, um, or some collage pieces. 
So can you just touch on, like, you know, you use language in a really interesting way. Can you touch on uh, your perspective of the word collage and how it kind of fits into everything you do, um, mm. just briefly for yeah. me? Yeah, so collage, uh, thinking about bringing uh, multiple disparate parts and pieces together into uh, one framework to essentially create a new space, mm -hmm. a new idea, yeah. ask new questions. Um, it's about this idea of isolation, isolating parts and pieces from, from different areas and what those parts and pieces hold mm -hmm. in terms of the, the collective whole that they're now become a part of when I create the collage. Yeah. All right. I think about collage like, um, like different processes of like additive collage where you're just kind of continuing to build up and build up and then subtractive where you're just kind of like cutting back out and replacing. Mm. Um, it's like puzzle pieces. I think of collage yeah. as, as a puzzle. Right? Um, I never really start with the idea of what I want the collage to look like. It really starts from, and this is why, one of the reasons why I put this here. In, in my studio, there are these piles and mounds of different types of materials. I have buckets and boxes of different materials when I'm working um, in the studio. I might be um, you know, having four or five pieces going at one time and have three or four bins, and then halfway through the production of maybe two of those pieces, I take all those bins away and bring new bins out mm -hmm. as a way to refresh the palette. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's just—it's really a lot about these kinds of like you know holding like this this material here and asking the question like, what what can this be? Not what is it, mm. but what can this potentially be yeah. and become? You know. And this is one of the things that I enjoy most about this process of of collage. Yeah. Um, when I first, we, we did our first studio visit, uh, I, was, I was sitting in your studio and there was a, a very large sculpture behind me and I said, so, so walk me through your process and your collage work, which I'm about to literally ask you. And he was like, for which thing? And I was like, oh, that's a, that's a pretty interesting question. Yeah, for which thing? Because most of what you do can, can really be viewed through that lens. It can mm -hmm. really be seen through that perspective of exploration of what is the, per, what is the function mm -hmm. and then what could an alternative reinvented way of looking at something be, mm -hmm. um, which I think is, so, is, just, is just so interesting because it really is such a strong theme throughout all of the ways that you use things, you know, mm -hmm. and that you reinvent objects. Um, so, you know, with, with that kind of, like, now that we have a little bit more of a background of a base, walk me through your, like, actual process of your collage. You just touched on the fact that you don't have anything in mind going directly into it, but how mm -hmm. do you really begin? Yeah, so the process, in terms of the 2D collage, like, collages that are more on, on paper as opposed to, um, and this is going back to the question about collage again, right? Mm -hmm. So. There, there are all of these terms within like art vocabulary, like collage and assemblage. Yeah, right. Yeah. Assemblage meaning like bringing objects together, perhaps. But I also view those as collage too. Um, I think that the the word like assemblage gives a very uh, a very specific um, in thinking of three dimensional, mm -hmm. but. For my own sense and purposes, I think of collage all the way through, whether it's a three-dimensional object or whether it's a two-dimensional object. And um, in the way that I, I, I process um, making the collages, it's definitely like um, through different avenues. So for instance, the Bundle House. So I have a, a series of work called Bundle House. And Bundle House itself, you're seeing these bundle houses as they're, is this still rotating or is this paused? I think that it might have stopped rotating. Okay, so can, can you uh, keep this rolling for me sure. please? Um, so in, in the Bundle House work, Bundle House really speaks to the idea of rebuilding one's life from things that remain. And that's the, the literal sense of it. Mm. Um, uh, the metaphorical sense, I should say. The literal sense is finding materials, bundling them together in order to make some sort of shelter. There are many people that live like this around the world, um, whether it's because of natural disaster, man-made disasters, whether it's war, famine, genocide, that people have to flee their homes and rebuild their lives from things that remain, right? Starting over. And so with that, with that work, I, I definitely have the idea in mind of what this is going to be. Yeah. When I begin it, it begins like this is going to be a work about bundle house. It is mm -hmm. going to be about these structures and the, and, and the environment that these, that these structures exist in. Mm. When it's like 2D collage, um, 
like for instance, the, the works that I'm doing on, on maps, the, the old maps, I look at the map and I ask the map to inform me of like, what, what, what is it that this collage is going to be in as a way to be integrated with the map that I'm working with, right? What is the history of this place within the map that, that I might know about? or I don't know about that I want to research. Yeah. And then having that, once I start to like have that inform the, the subconscious and the conscious mind, then it's like flipping through magazines. And then, ah, oh, okay, like here's, here's a, a part right now that relates to that concept or that idea or that piece of history I just learned about that map. So now I cut that piece out and I put it there, right? Yeah. So it's this process of like building and asking the questions between the subject matter and what I'm encountering as I'm flipping through the magazine. Yeah. One of the, the, the fascinating things um, for me too is like sometimes I may look through the same 10 magazines as I'm working through to make two, three collages. Mm -hmm. And it all depends on where I am within the stage of that process of creating those collages do I find the use or the appropriate use of something that I have come across and passed 20, 30 times already, yeah. you know? And not until it's time, right, mm -hmm. determined by the progress of that work mm -hmm. that I find a place for that thing. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And you it's not that I ever remember it. like looking for it, it just like pops up like, oh, yeah, okay, now. Yeah, it's your time, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned like the buckets, the bins, and then you also brought like all of this material for us to get a visual. Where do you get this stuff from? You mm -hmm. said magazines. How do you collect this? So um, it's uh, a mixture of different ways, like friends mm. give me things. They say, hey, I got a box of all these things that you probably could use for your studio. And at this stage now, I ask them, just take a photo and send me, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> they bring stuff and I'm just like, ah, yeah. <laughs> I can't yeah. use this one, you know. Um, so yeah, so friends donate stuff to me. Um, sometimes I go uh, to, to thrift shops okay. um, and, you know, you find like, you know, quantity of things sometimes really inexpensively. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah just, you know, bat magazines that come to our home. I'm constantly collecting them, keeping them. Yeah, so it's a constant process. Even when I'm walking the street, like it's, it's constantly like a, my eyes are, are peeled for interesting objects and materials and stuff too. Okay. Is, you know, you, naturally through what you're exploring from, from your previous experiences and just what you're interested in, you have a pattern of reuse is like, you know, you're mentioning climate change in your bio. Is that kind of a, a purposeful decision or is that also something that's just naturally in line with the expression? Mm. No, it's a, it's a very intentional decision. Okay, yeah. Um, one, because of uh, just thinking about our human existence. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we prioritize things that we enjoy. We are here talking about art. We're here, you know, um, in, this, in this place. But eventually, um, the decisions that we make as human beings here on this planet Earth is going to affect our ability to continue to exist, mm. right? And so um, climate change is a, is a very real thing, especially thinking about the Caribbean, like mm -hmm. where my parents are from, yeah. where my family still lives, where I have many friends. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like ground zero for climate change. Yeah. And so that also impacts um, my thinking about what can, what can art do? Asking the question, what can art do? Mm -hmm. um, it can raise awareness. It can um, um, engage in conversation about possibilities. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is, um, yeah, I think that's how I'll, I'll leave it there <laughs> for now. I think that it's interesting, though, because it's, it's, it's definitely a perspective that's important for us to keep in mind, especially in spaces like this, where that question of like, well, are we going to discuss climate change while simultaneously utilizing materials that are made in ways in which are so hazardous to the environment, mm. you know, um, and then further worsening through trying to get people to think about that idea, we're continuing to keep make, be making the problem worse. Um, so I, I really enjoy that. And it's quite refreshing about your work is that you are truly engaged in using things that are already have been used, mm -hmm. you know, um, and it, like you said that, you know, some stuff is just stuff, uh, but that you're actively choosing to, to make people think about that reality. Um, 
especially like in any island, you mm -hmm. know, um, and, and, and connect it to that sense of um, ingenuity and innovation, um, and while still using something that is not continuously in, like, increasing the mm -hmm. issue. Um, which I, I think is really nice. Uh, so, you know, as we've, we've kind of mentioned this, but you use, like, you use, a, even just on your, your paper-based uh, 2D collage work, you use fabric and you integrate mat other kinds of materials into that as well. Can you speak to that just, like, a little bit? I know we have a piece right here as well. Mm -hmm. If you want to speak on that. Yeah. I mean, in, in terms of, like, um, the use of fabric you're interested in? Yeah, or even just, like, do you incorporate other, uh, like, more material than just images from magazines from the photos that you've taken in the past. Yeah, um, so here is, here's one example um, of a sculpture. I call them sculpture. Some people call them assemblage. I go back and forth. Collage, <laughs> right? But it, it is a sculpture using um, found materials. Um, I'm using found wood to create the uh, a, a kind of a crude armature or structure on, on top of which I lay all of these fabrics on top. Um, they are, there, there's stories behind each one of these and in the way that I find the materials. And this one in particular, this was the second piece that I did in 2019 um, when I first started teaching. I was teaching in uh, Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. And I live in New Jersey. I just came down to Dallas. I'm getting my studio set up there and I don't have any materials yet. I probably brought like a little box of stuff with me. And the first thing that I'm thinking to myself is, I'm in the studio, I'm ready to make, where am I gonna go right now to find materials? Like, I can't walk out of the campus, There's the, they keep the grounds clean, yeah, I there's nothing yeah. to find, you know? So there's a dumpster right outside of the theater department, in the back of the theater. So they, they're constructing things, they're throwing their waste in there. So I'm like, oh, this is a dumpster. Let me go check out and see what's in the dumpster. So I go and I look, and there's all these objects, like wood parts and pieces. But then there's also to um, a sorority had thrown away bags and bags and bags of these clothing, of these apparel. Oh, okay. So with their, all of their, their lettering on it. Yeah. And oh, so no. <laughs> it was a wonderful find because now I have this trove of fabric. I have mm. this trove of, of wood. Mm. Um, that is, has already been used and discarded. So now mm. I come back to the studio and this is the second sculpture that was created using those materials. So that wow. X on there is actually from a fraternity. Um, I don't remember what it was, I mean a sorority, I don't remember which one it was. Wow. Even the finger that's pointed down, the black and pink, that comes mm. from a t-shirt from that as well. All right, so these things have these stories. These, these objects have these stories of, of where the materials are coming from. I could yeah. point to, um, so for instance, the new sculpture that I'm working on in the studio, a lot of the, the materials on there um, are incorporating a lot of the materials that I found in my recent trip to West Africa. Mm. So they, they kind of also tell a time of my life, of where yeah. I was in that period of time where I made those works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is just a question that no one planned and that I'm interested in. So like, are you on the street and you're like, oh, that's interesting, and then you like put it in your pocket? Like, how does that actually go? You know, or are you, are you, is it normally more of like a, you know, you're in a shop or you're over here or over there? Like, yeah. like this is just something that I'm interested in. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's um, some days, so for instance, when I'm traveling, um, I carry like an extra bag to be oh, able to okay. do that. okay, all right. All right. It's premeditated, um, okay. It, it's premeditated. <laughs> it's also, um, you know, sometimes I don't plan on picking up stuff and I don't bring the bag, but I might see something and I have to think about, all right, is there a place that I can put this in isolation from my stuff? Yeah. You know, and if, if I do have something like that and it makes sense that I can carry it and not feel like this now is like weighing me down on my way around, mm. then I pick it up. Yeah. You know? yeah. Wow. Um, so, you know, you, 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 you mentioned West Africa, which is a, a trip where you um, you have some really, really, really beautiful collage pieces that you're currently working on, uh, and you've been taking your own photographs. Can you explain to me how integrating photography into your practice and how, how, how has that changed um, and impacted your collage work? Mm. Yeah, so my, um, I take photographs constantly as, as, part, as an interdisciplinary artist. I have a photographic practice as well. Mm -hmm. And during my travels, um, it's one of the things like, so my wife and I, we have this competition. Um, we call it the Gordon Parks Award. So at the end of each day, we kind of look at our best photos and we say like, all right, let me see your, let me see your best photo. So I'll show fun. you mine. And we give each other the award for who had the best photo of the mm -hmm. day. 
Uh, so constantly taking photos. And this trip, <clears throat> um, so we went to Lagos, Nigeria, we went to um, different parts of Togo and different parts of Benin. Mm. And um, a lot of times we were in the car, like going from place to place to place, especially when we were in Lagos, we hardly, we didn't really walk anywhere. Mm. So it became a process of me trying to figure out learning how to document um, while we were in a moving car, like effective ways of doing that. Yeah. And I became really fascinated with um, creating images from a moving vehicle, mm -hmm. um, which essentially I'm sitting, so the landscape is usually at a certain height and perspective. Yeah. And so with these photographs, what I, when I started to notice a lot of these um, kind of similarities and common themes, then I, I started to create these photo collages only using my photos from, from West Africa, from those three countries, to recreate the landscapes mm. in the way that I, that I experienced the landscape. Yeah. So like, as an example, the constant state of development and underdevelopment. Mm. The, um, the, the constant visualization of entrepreneurship, people vending, people selling things, people building the stands for them to sell things. Um, the, the way that clothing patterns change from, lands, from, from environment, from neighborhood, from region to region. Mm. All of these different types of things, people's um, kind of cohabitation between human and machine, like all of these big cranes and these things are just kind of like left in spaces yeah. of undevelopment and development and people are kind of like cohabiting that space with yeah. the machine. So all of these different things are fascinating to me and I'm creating these, these collages, these photo collages from those images. Mm. So can you tell me a little bit about some of the, like we've gotten into one or two of the ideas that you, that you work through, that you express, that you hope to um, share with your, with your viewers and with your collectors. Is there anything that we haven't touched on uh, that that is really vital to like the, the not just the goal of your work, but that's like in your work, mm. you know. Mm. Oh, ooh. <laughs> we can come back to that if you need yeah, to. Yeah, well. I mean, <laughs> there's there's just so much. Yeah. You know? Yes, I, there is. There, yeah. There's so much, and and I don't say that lightly, because there is um, when I started really getting serious about um, ideas embedded in artwork, it was when I shifted from making art purely from aesthetics mm. to realizing the importance of my work also having the ability to um, at least um, bring awareness to some sort of specific issue that's, that is important as it relates to um, being human. Mm, yeah. and, um, and that's when I began Bundle House because I was just purely working from aesthetics with found materials, and then I met this photographer, her name is Shanoa Maxwell, and she had just come back from Uganda from a photo excursion. And these photos that she took in many of the, the refugee camps, some of the villages adjacent to the refugee camps, mm -hmm. um, that were as a result of genocide that was happening there, at that point, that was 2005, 2004 going 2005. So not many people around the world knew what was going on there at that time. Yeah. And so when I saw the photos, I couldn't help but like the images of the structures that people were building to live, to yeah. provide shelter for themselves, they resonated to me as sculpture. Mm. And then second of all, then they, they kind of made me um, see the relationship between some of the things that I've been feeling when I'm creating from aesthetics, but don't really have a word or have mm -hmm. something else to attach to it. Yeah. So when I saw that, it was like this kind of bringing together, uh, uh, bringing together something that was in me, a desire within me, mm -hmm. and now finding a purpose for that. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, that <clears throat> um, then had me ask other questions, like mm -hmm. thinking about what was going on in that specific region of Africa. Mm and perhaps what, is the, what were some of the causes of that, yeah. right? And some of the causes of that literally was the, um, the, like the, the mining and the extraction of the precious minerals mm -hmm. and, and other, other precious things from that region. Mm -hmm. And so now it's like, okay, what's the history of that? So it's like it keeps going back and back and spiraling, 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 spiraling. And it and ultimately came down to like thinking about um, music 
and the music of Fela Kuti mm, of the yeah. 60s, um, 70s that really um, brought me into asking questions about colonialism and then seeing the connection f between colonialism and the present day extraction of these mm -hmm. like precious minerals and things like that. So yeah. this is how all of these themes are then embedded in the work. Mm -hmm. But then outside of that, it's like thinking about a relationship of those who are perhaps um, outside of that specific region, but in some ways also experiencing the hand of colonialism. Yeah. and neo-colonialism, yes. yeah. you know? So all of these things are, are, are so integrated um, in the work and finding ways to, um, to share this and have a dialogue in ways that allow the conversation to open outside of the specificity of region mm. um, is, is one of those other things that I'm fascinated with. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that it's, it's really interesting how, especially with a lot of very meaningful big personal ideas and 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 concepts especially with you know work that's that's as multifaceted as yours um, it's so it can be hard to to digest in one conversation you mm. know it can it can be difficult to write about because there's so much that goes into it and making that concise and understandable in an easy way to grasp can be very difficult uh, but one of the ways that artists do that is through the symbols that they use in their work through things that we see and we you know innately subconsciously attach it to that other thing that we're already familiar with and then that communicates to us oh that's about that thing yeah I know that thing I know mm -hmm. that feeling mm -hmm. um, can you talk to me a little bit about some of the symbols that you use in your work um, to try to help communicate some of some of those really complicated feelings and ideas. Mm. So um, I think the use of symbols in my work they they evolve. Right? Sometimes mm -hmm. there's like periods of periods of time where a symbol or a group of symbols may um, be present, and then as time goes on, you may see them less and less. Mm, yeah. And they come from really as a way of trying to distill information. Mm. So as an example, I use the checkerboard pattern in my work a lot. And the checkerboard, when the checkerboard shows up, it's in relation to the way that I think about um, uh, the spaces of importance um, within, within uh, a, a colonial or a, neo, a, a colonial space, a colonized space. So thinking about the Caribbean specifically, if you're going to start just for specificity, like thinking about the cathedrals, yeah. in some of these places, thinking about the government buildings, right? They erect these, um, these, these, these like structures that are imposing as a way to kind of um, uh, flex yeah. their power. Yeah. And stamp. part of that is through beauty as well. Mm. And so by the, some of the floors, like these really beautiful ornate marble floors, which I'm totally fascinated with within these architectural structures, and yet the, the kind of the, the haunting sound of hard bottom shoes walking in such a space with this kind of echo. Mm. If someone is to whisper something in one side of the room, you'll hear the whisper in another section and the kind of like creepiness about all that, yeah. right? So when you see the, the checkerboard floor, I'm referring to these kinds of spaces that hold these secrets, that hold archives, that, mm. that kind of um, exercise, um, um, blatantly exercise power and then s also to kind of like subtly and psychologically exercise power. Yeah. Right. So this is what the, when you see the checkerboard, so as a symbol, mm. this is what that is, is, um, is, is alluding to. That's beautiful. Um, you also use, I know that you use bells in a, in a lot of your work. You had, um, you know, one in the bundle house that was just depicted there. You use them in your performance work. Can you talk about the, the use of that symbol and sort of what that is depicting and what that's speaking to? Mm -hmm. The, the bell? Bell, yes. Yeah, so um, as we think about sound, um, sound being used to, uh, as a calling, sound being used to heal, sound um, being used to, as a warning. Mm. Um, I think about many different ways of, of the way that sound um, can be used. Um, the bell in, in, is primarily present in my performance work. And um, growing up in Trinidad, like my family, uh, my mother's side of the family is um, primarily spiritual Baptist. Mm -hmm. And this is a faith that fuses um, the, a lot of Yoruba spiritual practices that came with the enslaved Africans um, 
they brought the Yoruba spiritual practice and that fused with the Baptist faith mm. when um, people brought it, essentially left the United States and came to Trinidad mm. and brought Baptist, um, the Baptist faith with them. And there's a fusion of that. It's also a fusion of other different um, spiritual practices as well. Mm. And the bell is present within a worship ceremony or service. Mm. And that is like to call the spirit. Mm. It's also to, to, to repel any negative spirit mm -hmm. as well. Um, it's used as a way to punctuate a moment. Um, and so when I incorporate the bell, it's in thinking about all of those things, mm. you know, and, and specifically for the purpose and the intention of, of some of those things. Interesting. Um, you also, like, work to sort of, you know, and you just, you just mentioned that, like, the difference between religion, especially from a colonial perspective, and then the idea of spirituality. Um, but that topic runs pretty congruently throughout a lot of your work. Can you just speak to those, those two different things and how you integrate them into your practice and sort of mm. what that commentary is, is, is meant to be expressing, um, you know, that you, if you haven't touched on, mm. on anything yet? <clears throat> I, I think um, for me personally, like spirit is, is I, is me, mm -hmm. you know, and there's no way to, it, it's part of lived, the, my lived experience. And as an artist, I think it's in, incredibly important um, for me personally as an artist to, um, to, to always honor that, mm -hmm. um, to, to try to, to separate that. One, it would be too much work. Yeah. And, then, and then two, it's, I feel like it does the, um, it does the work and the gift mm -hmm. um, a disservice. Uh, there is no other uh, space for me in this time of my life that's more sacred than being in the studio. Mm, yeah. That place where I am able to be utilized as a vessel, um, a place where I, I, I actually um, create, right? Like to that, that act of essentially not having the thing present yeah. and then one day the thing is present. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's a special, it's a special, it's a very special thing. Yeah. You know, and so I understand that that doesn't just come from me. Mm. I understand that it comes from somewhere else and it's the spirit moving through me. Mm. And this is one of the reasons why it's important to me to have that conversation as well. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times, frankly, like it's left out of art dialogue. Yeah. You know, people kind of separate the object and the process of making, the process of creation um, from spirit, yeah. you know, and um, I, I couldn't, that's, it's not something that I, um, that I found to be helpful mm. or to be inclusive. And the reason why I say that is because <clears throat> there are so many um, cultures that, that the act of creating, the making is is vital and integral to their each and every day. Mm -hmm. And many of these cultures have like deep-rooted spiritual practice that is one and the same with cre the creation of these things on an everyday basis. Mm -hmm. And when the art world separates this idea of spirit, then you're in a way, you're really kind of pushing a whole portion of the world's population who create out of the, the dialogue about yeah. art and making. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's also a way to, to raise a flag to those who are in that same, along that same journey and, and live that, that, that life. Absolutely, yeah. I've, I've actually, in this, um, uh, you know, program alone, have had already a couple conversations about the contemporary and the fine art world. Um, it's, it's sort of disinterest in discussing artwork that is made with sort of a, a spiritual component um, with a component in which an artist feels that they, uh, you know, they have a deeper connection to something. Um, that refusal and that kind of rejection, I think it's really interesting because it, it, it does, the, the, the line of thought is a, is a rejection of, um, of, you know, well, it's, a, it's an adaptation of like, you know, neo-colonialism, mm -hmm. the concept that in big white rooms, we only specifically look at specific things and we, t we obtain information from those and that's all that it's just going to be and it's not going to be anything other than that and anything that includes, you know, more, uh, more emotive 
uh, more abnormal, more, more kind of uh, foreign ideas is something that we are not interested in having a dialogue about or in integrating with mm. is absolutely a, a, a vestige of that kind of, you know, uh, colonial imperialist mindset, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is, is really interesting because you're not the first person who I've sort of had this, this kind of conversation with. And I think that it is really important to be to be touching on um, the fact that that's a huge part of a mm -hmm. big group's practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree yeah. with you. And uh, it's, you know, it's also too, it, with, my, with my work personally, there's, there's also a great joy in when um, people who are not like avid museum goers or art collectors yes. encounter the work and, mm. and have a, a, a connection with the work. Yeah, Because absolutely. the work is also, um, it, in the way that it's made, in the mm. materials that I incorporate, or the imagery that I create um, is able to reach past all of these other things that the art world has put over this concept of what art is and reach the person. Yes. You know, and, and I'm still, um, you know, if I can probably talk all day about ways of, of trying to figure out how to do that, mm, right? Yeah. But I think a, a lot of it has to do with the materials. You know, yeah. A lot of it has to do with the materials and the treatment of the materials. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I like create a sculpture here with all of these, you know, um, if I go back to this, the sculpture here, after I created it, it was like, it still was so fresh and new, mm. still felt fresh and new. It has this kind of energy that's building, but not until I took, um, I collect soil uh, from different parts of the world, mm -hmm. essentially. And think about it through this idea of being the diaspora, soil from different parts of the diaspora. And, you know, it's not, uh, I collect soil. Okay. Yeah. So in the studio, I have the soil there and it's like not until I put that soil on top of this thing to kind of dirty it up a little bit, yeah. does it not, it doesn't have the ashe, it doesn't have mm -hmm. the power yet, yeah. you know? And then once I put the soil on top of it and it, 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 it brings it into the everyday, the used, yes. the worn, the yes. experienced, yeah. um, then it feels a little bit more like connected approachable you know? yeah, yeah interesting yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um i want to you you mentioned flags like a couple of minutes ago and I, I do want to ask you about your use of flags and you mentioned specifically within your collage work you know you're exploring using flags so i, I want you to touch on that and then also um you, your use of flags in the construction aspect mm. yeah so flags um i've had an interest in in flags uh, for, for quite some time and thinking about um, like being this hybrid as, in, in, as a person, right? Born here in the United States, American flag, mm -hmm. right? Or the American flags, you know, yeah. history over time. Um, thinking about the flag of Trinidad and Tobago and the flag mm -hmm. of Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, and then also too, as, as a person who considers themselves a Pan-Africanist mm -hmm. and a person who considers themselves um, a, a citizen of the Caribbean region, like all those flags as well. Yeah. Right? And then thinking about like the history of flags in a way that sometimes of, it, to this day, some flags that exist um, for some countries or territories are actually flags that are um, including imagery or created by the former colonizer, mm -hmm. right? But yet they still hold on to the symbol, they still hold on to the flag. Yeah. And so I'm interested in what flags hold in, in that way and the ways that we can re uh, recreate flags or create new flags mm -hmm. to um, get closer to um, a, a, a certain kind of um, um, connection to the people within that space, yeah. right? So as, as an example, there's a flag that I created um, titled uh, flag, um, uh, it was a flag that I created in Martinique and I created this flag as a way of thinking about um, Martinique still being under French rule, right? So Martinique not in being independent, they're still under French rule, mm. they have the Martinican flag which was a former French Navy flag, mm. right? Which is still their flag. Yeah. And so, but then they have this, this beautiful fabric called Madras, right? Which is like, um, you know, this is, a, this is a commercialized, made in China Madras here, but Madras is an incredibly, um, pro, this, this 
this material is, is proliferated all around the country and yeah. used as a tool of commercialization. Yeah. They print them on cups, they print them on plates, they print them on dolls, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So when I went there for, um, for a, a biennial, the first time I went, I saw this material everywhere and I'm like, what, what is this thing? Yeah. So now in learning that, the, learning the history that they brought this material from bringing the indentured servants from India mm. to Martinique, it came with them from the place called Madras, right? Mm. It's no longer called Madras, but it came with them. Yeah. And then the history where it turns to become this material produced in China. Mm -hmm. Shunned by the population because it's like kind of reminder of a subservient past. Yeah. Right? People, the servants in the home wore Madras, mm. right? You would see it there. So the contemporary, pe contemporary society doesn't really embrace this material, but it's all over the place. Yeah. So I was asking myself, in what ways can we, since it's here, how can we kind of bring it into the fold mm. and recontextualize it? Mm -hmm. So the flag was one way of doing that. So I designed the flag using the colors, the red, black, and green Pan-African colors, yeah. which is actually the, the, and in the design of the Pan, the, um, the independentists, so there's a movement for independence in Martinique, and they have this red, black, and green flag. Mm. So I use red, black, and green Madras pieces to create a flag in that way, right? Mm. To kind of start the conversation about these types of recontextualizations, these kinds of forward thinking, and thinking about independence and things like that within mm -hmm. the country. Very interesting. Did you have an opportunity to, to put it anywhere? To, to integrate it into that, into that population, you know? Did you get any feedback mm -hmm. on that? Yeah, so what I did was, and thank you for that question. Yeah. Um, so this work was done there in Martinique. Mm -hmm. um, I basically started to shop for the different colors of red, black, and green madras because, you know, this, if you stand back, this can have the illusion of pr primarily red or primarily yellow, mm. right? So I've, I had to be selective in the material. And then I would take those fabrics everywhere with me every conversation I, I, I had about the history of Martinique, every person that I wanted to meet to learn perhaps about the, the, um, the folklore of Martinique, like these fabrics traveled everywhere with me to be charged by these conversations, to be charged by the experiences. Sometimes if I'm meeting someone for a lunch to have a conversation, mm -hmm. I put the fabric as a tablecloth. So now it's absorbing the food <laughs> and the things. Yeah. So now when I make the flag, it's now embedded with all of that experience and all of that information mm. um, and care mm -hmm. right? and generosity from the people that were there. So that's, that's one way. And then what I did was I activated it by putting it in different places around okay. Martinique, where, yeah. where we traveled to, outside of the museum, outside of the, um, that, the, music, the Museum of Ethnography. Mm. Um, we, I went with a group of artists to make performances. I took it and performed it on the beach. Okay. Right, so running with this flag, mm. I laid it down on the ground and, and asked people to like, lay on it. And specifically, mixed race um, Martinican women mm. to lay on these, like thinking about the history of um, photography and the way that the, the bodies, especially the, the bodies of women, were used as a way to exoticize the space in order mm. to um, contribute to the, the commercialization of the space. Yes. Tourism, yeah. all of that. So mm -hmm. it was kind of like going into that archive, going into that, that history of the image, especially of this kinds of like lounging and things like that, but mm. now recontextualizing as using the flag as the the mat or the towel to lounge on the beach, right? Mm. So all of these different ways. And a lot of times I'm not premeditating these ideas. It's mm. like on the spot, uh-huh, let's try this. Mm. Can we try this? Can we try this? And it's a lot about permission. Yeah. So I'm not recreating somebody else's flag, mm. you know, as an outsider yeah. without some like serious consultation with people, some dialogue mm -hmm. about it. You know, having that local buy-in, yeah. having people support the idea, mm -hmm. asking questions, is this a, what do you think of this idea? Yeah. Is it meaningful? Yes. You know? Is it necessary? Um, yes. Is it ne I mean, that, I don't know if it's ever necessary, yeah. <laughs> ever <laughs> yeah, necessary but is it meaningful? Yeah. Is it productive? Mm -hmm. You know, is it, is it offensive? Mm. You know, because this is another thing that, that's really important, especially when we're doing work in other spaces. Yes. Like, to think about the 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 local customs mm -hmm. the local spiritual practices yeah. right? run into a huge problem in martinique even another year that i went with a performance art festival where people came and they brought their own performances that really look like ritual and they bring their ritual to a space where there's 
a legacy and history of ritual in the space. And your, your, your ritual is actually coming against that mm -hmm. through the imagery and the objects you're using, mm. problematic, right? So yeah. all of these different things that um, um, kind of come back to the flag sensitivity of mm -hmm. space, um, thinking about future, thinking about how materials and objects can be used to raise these questions and address some of these topics. I think that it's such an interesting, it's such an interesting reminder too, to understand and, and kind of pull focus to that sense of ownership and identity. Mm. A lot, as Americans, we are well aware of what our flag means, what it looks like, because it's everywhere in America. If you go to other countries, they don't do that as much. You know, it, it's sort of odd. I've had friends come here from many different parts of the world and they think that it's kind of awkward that we have this kind of constant visual reminder of like where we are as if we will forget or as if we're not entirely sure. Um, you know, it's sort of this over-processed sense of pride, but it is, it's, such an, it's such a fascinating reminder to consider from a colonial perspective um, and then, you know, to consider what, what does that do we all agree that that's what we look like? Do we all agree mm. that that's the fabric of us? Mm. You know, and, and, and what does that hold? Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm so, I'm so grateful that you, you these, shared that I story. Mean, so this is, is fascinating you bring that up too because it's like sometimes the flag isn't, um, isn't only proliferated or uh, highly or hyper visible within the specific country. Mm. It might be also hyper visible in other countries. So for instance, the American flag being hyper visible yeah. in Egypt. Yeah. Especially like in Cairo, mm -hmm. um, hyper, visible, hyper visible in Havana, Cuba, mm. right? So it's like these yeah. questions about how did this possibly happen? Yeah. How is these ideas that you're talking about that make people feel so connected to the flag here in, in the United States, how, mm -hmm. how is that even possible through this image or in what way is it now possible using that flag in other countries and other yeah. spaces? Yeah, you know? yeah, and the different understanding and perspective of what that symbol means mm -hmm. you know because mm -hmm. it is different it is yeah. not the same it's not the same visual uh, you know tick in your head that you you understand it's a completely different relationship to that imagery um, I want to I want to ask you you know we're talking about travel we're talking about movement uh, which a lot of your work is, is, is about you know that transientness that need to move um, can you talk about your own traveling as an artist mm -hmm. um, and how that, that's so kind of integral to your work and how it's informing a lot of what you're doing moving forward? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so um, travel became really important to my practice um, starting like in, in 2016 was um, that a pivotal shift. I was teaching uh, full-time teaching art at a school called St. Peter's Prep in Jersey City mm -hmm. and I taught there for eight years. And there was, a, there was a moment where I just was like, all right, I need to, because my career started as an artist started to really pick up, I re realized that um, time, I needed more time for my work. Yeah. And so I went back to get my MFA and I was still teaching. I was doing a, a low residency MFA program, which allowed me to still keep my full-time job while pursuing the master's degree. Mm. And so after getting the master's degree, Right, right before I graduated, I was nominated for the Leonore Annenberg Performing and Art Visual Fund. Mm -hmm. And when I looked, when they told me, they were like, hey, this is, the, this is the, the prize, the fellowship money and stuff like that, I was like, all right, this is my ticket out. Like, this will help <laughs> me to be able to quit my job and at mm -hmm. least have some sort of like confidence for the first year mm -hmm. um, to be able to just make that leap. Yeah. And, and I did that. Um, mm -hmm. And for the proposal for this fellowship, was that I would travel throughout the Caribbean and Africa mm. to, um, to, to, to investigate specific questions that inform my practice. Mm. And so uh, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, Martinique, Jamaica, Cuba, Ghana wow. were the places that were on that list. Yeah. Um, so I had very specific questions in each one of those places. Mm. Um, I've spent a minimum of a month in, in, these location, in each one of these locations. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that really helped to move the needle for me. Mm. Um, the thing that helped me to understand how important that was, or is, was for my written thesis, my master's thesis, oh, I, love I wrote this story <laughs> that was centered on carnival in Trinidad. <clears throat> now, I had never experienced carnival as an adult in Trinidad. So all of my knowledge about it was only through imagery 
um, through through what my friends tell me, yeah. and from um, the research that I did was actually like do all the readings that I was doing, but also calling people who are, um, are, are people who actively participate in masquerade in mass mm. in Trinidad, and so. I felt like I was so informed in writing this this piece. This and we had the opportunity to create, a, uh, do a, a creative uh, alternative format. So we didn't. It didn't have to be like an academic style paper. Um, as long as you had like your research cited and all that. I wrote a story, right? That was set during the time of carnival. Mm -hmm. And so I'm feeling good about this thing and um, well researched. I got my bibliography and all that. Mm -hmm. And then I go to Trinidad. I'm going to all the lectures about carnival. I'm going to like all the competitions. I'm I'm actually participating. I'm like going to different, what they call um, mass camps, where different groups of people are making costumes together. And so I'm going to all these different places. And then when I came back, and I played mass, so I played juve. I'm out there carnival Monday, carnival Tuesday, the most beautiful experience, one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. And I come back, and about a month later, I read my thesis. And oh, I was cringing, I was cringing, I was cringing. <laughs> because the language that I was using and the way that I was writing about these things, mm -hmm. like I, I literally sounded like a white ethnographer from, from like the <laughs> early 1900s yeah, writing about no. this experience in the Caribbean. Yeah. Like the language that I was using, the ways that I, um, the way that I kind of, um, kind of speculated on certain things mm. within the story, it just was like a, uh, a mess. Mm. <laughs> However, um, I was, I, I definitely was, was, um, I still felt proud about the work. Yeah. But I, I recognized, one is I recognized the importance of being in the space. Yeah. Like you can't just write about it without ever having experienced it, mm. you know? And so that was one of the most important lessons for me. I'm making all this work about the Caribbean and the history of the Caribbean, but not really traveling to the Caribbean is a little, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. it started to happen a lot and it has been happening a lot more. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, when, when you first told me that story, I mentioned that, you know, it, it's, it's so awful, but it's so important to look back on things you did and go, oh, I don't know about that, because it does mean that you got something. You know, you mm -hmm. learned something, you've grown, you've expanded yeah. your understanding, your knowledge, your skills. Um, so I, it's, it's nice to hear that there are, you know, no matter how successful you get, you're still going to keep maybe looking back upon even in your masters, oh, yeah. um, you know, and saying, oh, I don't know about that. Um, uh, you know, you've mentioned really briefly, can you share a little bit about your teaching career and how that has mm. also like, kind of informed some of your work? Yeah. Um, so teaching high school was one of those things. Um, I think at that stage, uh, now that I look back on it, it was critical um, for one to give me a sense of structure at mm. that time. Um, you know, first, of, first and foremost, like having to be there at a certain time in the morning and I'm locked in there for a certain time of day and still knowing that I'm an active artist that's exhibiting work, I still have to make time to make the work. Yeah. And so it gave me a lot more like structure and discipline in mm. that way. Um, and then second of all, then the next thing was um, having to, to be informed, you know, in order to teach art and you know, like having to constantly be up on materials, you know, students mm. will, will come to me and say, Mr. Smith, um, I want to make this thing. And I was looking at this thing on YouTube and they were using this material and I have, I know nothing about this material. Now I got to go research the material. I'm like, wow, this material, yeah. I can use it for in yeah. my own work, you know? So all of this constant, constant learning, mm. um, staying in it. Mag I'm, I was much more aware of artists and who was doing what yeah. because we had subscriptions to many of the art magazines and in class I'm constantly flipping through it as I'm walking around as in order to be able to also show the students what you're doing a professional artist is doing look mm, you know yeah, be able to yeah. provide references for them so it kept me I think it kept me sharp in in that way yeah um, and it also helped me to really think about like um, my future mm. as an artist mm. because of that structure yeah. so that helped me to say well okay these are the things like I'm making a certain income teaching there. It provides me this kind of living. Mm -hmm. If I am not teaching, um, what happens to that kind? What happens to that living? Yeah. Right. Um, are there are there opportunities for greater? Mm -hmm. Are there are there um, obvious um, um, signs of having to scale back in some areas? Like, so it's all of these things that really like it helped me to think about not only art but life. Yeah. You know, art and life. And then also the importance of teaching kids about art and teaching kids about art in a way that helps them to be better citizens in the world. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know, um, I'll give you one, one quick example is 
the freshman curriculum was connected to what they were studying in world civilization. So you have like, um, you got like, there was, they have their African, uh, African civilization, right? Whatever that means, broad umbrella. Yeah. Asian civilization, um, blah, 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 like ancient Rome, ancient Egypt. Mm. And they were having these things in silos. And when, we were, when I came there, so for instance, like um, Asian art, mm -hmm. they were primarily just doing like calligraphy yeah. with ink, ink right? Yeah, the brush ink paintings paper. and stuff. It's like, okay, I understand that. It's directly <laughs> related to this idea of like art that comes from a certain part of Asia. But then mm. there's like this vast region, right? So much more of Asia that we're kind of not connecting with, mm -hmm. right? I showed my students, when we talked about African art, one of the things I love to do was show them a video um, of the house music scene in South Africa. Yeah. And in this video, like, you're seeing people jump into, like, the DJs, they jump into their cars and they're driving through the city and you're seeing the sky rises and you're seeing, like, them jump mm -hmm. out and people all fan dress fancy for the mm -hmm. club. And some of the students are sitting there, like, and these are freshmen now, they're sitting there like, Mrs. Smith, this is Africa? Yeah. This, is, is this really Africa? It's like, yeah, this is Africa because they're seeing high rises. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. seeing people in fancy cars. They're yeah. seeing people well dressed. They're seeing, you know, so uh, using art as a, to, as a, um, especially within education, as a way to help young people become better citizens mm -hmm. of the world. Yeah, which is so interesting because I think that a lot of people, especially now, especially in America, when we talk about having art classes in public school, in high school, it's sort of like, or do we need more artists? Mm. You know, and that's not necessarily mm. the goal. The goal of having an art class, yeah. but the goal of having art classes all throughout your education is to be able to create individuals who can problem solve. Mm. People who can look at something creatively and say, mm -hmm. I think that there's an alternative way of doing that, much like mm -hmm. the people who you were raised with, much like mm -hmm. These ideas that you're expressing in a lot of a lot of your work, where you're saying there are alternative ways to use things, to view things, to reconstruct things, to take mm -hmm. things apart, um, and we don't necessarily, you know, the intention isn't to create more sculptors and painters. The intention is to create like a citizen, mm -hmm. like a citizen who we need to yep. do all sorts of things, yep. um, which is yeah, just so. And then not to mention the whole trying to deconstruct the perspectives that we have in America. Um, uh, in, in, in talking about deconstructing, uh, your work discusses like this, this kind of reclamation of, of space, of, of, of sense of self and identity, um, and uh, refusal of colonial rule and all of the things that colonial rule has created. Um, how, within your work, have you, especially with talking about um, the Caribbean sort of involved the indigenous perspectives. Mm. You know, the people who, who are there or who, um, you know, were the original inhibitors of that land. Mm. Yeah, um, wow. So that for me is, um, I think when I think about this idea of uh, indigenous, it isn't something that is, um, that is a, a, a core of my work, like that, mm. that shows up very often in my work. Yeah. Um, the acknowledgement of, um, of indigenous spaces, I think, comes a lot through when I'm, when I'm making my maps. Mm. I think about um, the, the maps that I create. Um, as an example, um, these, these maps. Uh, OK, so if we go back to like this, this map here, which essentially is um, IT, the island of IT, which is the indigenous name for Hispaniola, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Where Haiti and Dominican Republic are, te are, are, are connected. Mm. And so, you know, entitling it Hispaniola as a way to kind of um, talk about what it's named now, but to highlight this idea of naming and the fact that this place also had another, another name. Yeah. After, when I, after I did this and I, I kept thinking about it, I kept asking myself, is it more powerful or is it is it more meaningful to have done it this way as opposed to writing the indigenous name, right? So there's this question that I still ask about that, but I think that even having it there mm. enables the conversation. Absolutely. Right? Um, so I think about that, um, you know, and then what I also do is think about the ways like using um, different types of flora, fauna, vegetation, um, some of the, what I call the cartouche um, within the illustrations on these maps yeah. relate back to a lot of the indigenous, mm -hmm. um, um, not only the people, but their practices, mm -hmm. perhaps some of the plants that they may have used, some of the yeah. foods that they've eaten. So I incorporate that within the, the artwork itself. Beautiful. 
and it's also you know it, the that focus too on like the plant life. A lot of the you know indigenous plants, trees, shrubs, they have all, you know, either gone extinct or they have been completely taken out of landscape. So, you know, reintegrating that into mm -hmm. the discussion around a place, a sense mm -hmm. of, um, you know, area is, is really interesting. Um, and sometimes they might still be present and just not, like, as time goes on, people yeah. forget some of their usage. Yes. You know, yeah. and their importance. Yeah. 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 Um, we're starting to get into the fuzzy stuff here. Uh, so maybe we can open it up. I feel like I'm talking. <laughs> talking sure. To yeah. Much. I would yeah. Love Do, to. Does anybody have any any questions so far? Phil. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so with the style of art that you make, it's never been always purposeful. Like when you set these the materials and help them put that into a thing. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, a lot of times, it's I see it for what it potentially can be. So, um, and that may not end up being the way that I utilize it. Um, but in the moment of of discernment of discernment of saying I want that, um, mm. it's like because I, I see all of these different potentials for it. Hmm. I don't think I would have been as innovative. Yeah, it's, it's really came out of the need. Because um, I, I absolutely wanted to paint on canvas. <laughs> I really wanted to be a, a, can a person who painted on canvas. And um, when I could afford it, I'd buy a canvas. Um, but that, um, that need to, to paint by any means, it became like um, a part of the aesthetic and a part of what made my work unique. You know, people will be able to look at it and say, aha, like Nugen made that, even mm -hmm. when I first began because of the, the material choices. But yeah, if I, had, if I had the resources, I don't think that I would have been utilizing those materials in the, as much as I did. And so then there's this ethical part of that is, do we take things away from people so that we can get them to innovate better, mm -hmm. right? So you can't really do that. So how do you create innovation in a space of wealth mm -hmm. that we're of advantage? I think, you know, that's a, a really wonderful question, and it remind, reminds me of a place that um, like we were, I think we were having a conversation about all of the different things that I was doing before I started teaching full-time at the high school. It's like mm -hmm. I had like four part-time jobs in order to make ends meet. Yeah. And in order to be able to structure my own, my days to be able to prioritize making art. And so I worked at a place called the Movement Space in Hoboken, New Jersey. And this was a space where um, it was basically, a, a, they had a summer camp. They also had this after school programs. <clears throat> and there were no toys there. There were no games there. There were, there were things like mats, big mats. There were big blocks. So mm. all of the things that happened, and there was art class, so we had supplies and stuff, but all of the, the games that the kids played, it was all about the imagination and the ingenuity of how to use these big mats and walls and things to come up with. And, and many of those kids that came there were, came from wealthy families. Mm. You know? And so stripping all of this, no this, there's like, you strip all that other stuff away, it starts to get back to that core of like innovation and mm -hmm. the imagination and things like that. So that's mm -hmm. one example you know, of ways to be able to do that. And I just want to make one more comment. I think you said that you questioned what can art do, what can art do. You might want to challenge you to rephrase that to what can't art do. Mm -hmm. um, because I think we don't do everything. Mm -hmm.
Oh, my God. So, within your artistic practice, can you find that you need more on the cultural aspects that you have been a part of or the spiritual things that you witnessed? And then, like, how much of your actual upbringing inside of, you said, with that spiritual? Spiritual background. Spiritual background, yeah. How much of that still influences your work? Do mm-hmm. you still practice? Or, no. So, yeah, so how much of that, I mean, previous, still influences your work? Mm-hmm. So the first part of that question was about the spiritual or cultural. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I think it's I think it's both of those and so much other so many other things. You know, when I listen to the news in a day and I hear, you know, of a landslide <laughs> in some place like that. You know, I listen to the news. I hear about um, you know another mass shooting that mm. affects. You know, I listen to the news and I hear about another armed, unarmed person of color being killed by police. Like that all affects the work. So my everyday lived experience impacts the work just as much as all of the other things that I talk about here. You know, mm. um, my, as far as my my like spiritual Baptist, like I grew up in it as as a child and as, as kids, you don't have the the, the option. <laughs> you know. Um, and so this is my, that was my exposure to it. And as an adult, well, even as a kid too, like we came to the United States, my grandmother is still practicing spiritual Baptist faith. My mom is now like, she's now here in the United States. She's like sometimes going to services, sometimes not. We come to the US, we go to a Catholic school. My mom was like, you're in a Catholic school, maybe you should become Catholic. So we get we make first <laughs> communion. Yeah. So it's like all of these kinds of mixtures that have, that has happened in my life that also have affected this work and this kind of hybridity of, of who I am. And I draw from all those hybrids and all those hyphens mm. um, in my identity. It's a really interesting question that you ask though. You know, like as, as humans, as we go about our lives, do we pull from like the present or the past? Mm. You know, like which, which one of those do we live in? And then which one of those informs our decisions and our thoughts and our feelings? It's a very interesting idea, Phil, yeah. How and the future heavily. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. I would prefer to live in the future as opposed to the past more often if I could choose. Um, yeah, do we have any other, like, I don't know, any other ideas or questions from our conversation so far? Oh, Julio. I have a question. I really, myself, enjoy making collage because I started drawing and painting and I had no patience for, for painting. I, I wanted immediate results. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I really like collage theory. That affects that, like that uh, is coming from my personality. Mm-hmm. How does your art making reflect your personality? Like, you... That's a good question. Yeah. How does my art making affect my personality, or not affect my? Oh, sorry. Uh, express. Express. Yeah. Yeah. Express. Yeah. Express. Yeah. express. My art making express my personality, huh? I am a. Um, I guess. A hoarder of information, <laughs> mm. and I often have diff- a difficult time like citing things. Mm. So I know the quote. I don't know where the quote came from. I know yeah. what the work looks like. I don't know who the artist is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all of these things are in my head, and then sometimes I end up like saying things in conversation. I'm like, oh, wh- wh- where, where did I get that? You know, um, mm. and it's it's like. <clears throat> My studio is full of all of these things and stuff that's piled in these areas, and you know I can go and access this kind of area. I think that that's that's one one way. I think also to the playfulness in in many of the objects, um, the playfulness in my performance, in my performance work. Like my performance work is is kind of like how I would like to be on a day to day day to day basis. Yeah, you know, like, like walking around like. Like this, <laughs> you know, just kind of walk in the street, you know, um, and and also to these ways of imagining um, interactions. So, for instance, um, making a performance, the, the the witnesses, people who are present for it, mm. become more likely to engage with the unknown than um, than if they weren't there for the performance, you know. So. Um, this helps me to think, sometimes think about like interactions with people. My 
the, the way, the things that I've learned from making performance work about what I learned about human nature and human interactions and human exchange, what I learned through performance work, I use that in my everyday, everyday life. De-escalation. Mm -hmm. um, how, do, how, do I, how do I draw someone into something? How do I um, complicate a situation? as a way to, to, to demonstrate something or to, um, to kind of lead a group into a certain, uh, a certain area to, or lead them to a certain understanding. Um, so I think the performance is, is one of those things um, that's really congruent with my lived experience and me as, me as a person. I love to just have an outburst of something, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and, and just enjoy the unpredictable. Um, and the unpredictable, not necessarily as, as, as um, ways of agitating, but sometimes un unpredictable in terms of care. Mm -hmm. You know, like all of a sudden someone feels as though they're being cared for in that moment. That's like a real transformative and impactful thing. Mm -hmm. um, so performance is one of those ways, I think, where my life, my personality is congruent with my, my work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? Well, we're just about actually at, at time with questions in taken into, in tandem. Um, so if we want to wrap up now, I have like just one or two more questions for you um, about what, 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 what will be next for you? Mm -hmm. where, 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 where will you be? Okay, so the next thing that's coming up that I'm really excited about um, I am, I have my first New York City solo exhibition mm -hmm. coming up in September. Thank mm -hmm. you, thank you. At uh, Sean Horton uh, Presents. Uh, this is a gallery on 20th, West 20th Street um, in Chelsea. Mm -hmm. um, and that opens uh, uh, September 8th. Okay. And that's gonna be congruent with uh, the Armory Show. Um, I'll have eight sculptures at the Armory Show. I'm curated in a special section called Platform, um, which is uh, a section where they're curating of uh, sculptural works. Okay. And so um, those are the two things. And then uh, at the end of September, middle of September, after those two openings, I go to the Congo uh, for the Congo okay. Biennial. Wow. So I'm part, uh, participating in Congo Biennial. Well. So those are the three things that I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about. That's oh, that's up. wonderful. Do you have any other travel plans of new things that we should keep an mm -hmm. eye out for too? Um, yes, so uh, in relation to, not necessarily like travel outside of those exhibitions, but mm. um, I also received the Creative Capital Award uh, okay. recently yes. and, the creative, and for a specific uh, project mm -hmm. that deals with my uh, African ancestry. So I did the mm -hmm. African ancestry DNA wow. um, to, to get, find my lineage mm. and I'm creating these um, sculptural busts um, out of bronze of myself, but using the scarification patterns of my African ancestors as a way to communicate with them in this world. Beautiful. Uh, so that's a, a forthcoming project that I'm, I'm really excited about. So. Wow, wow, congratulations. That's Thank exceptional. You. You. Um, so with all of these things moving forward, with all of this work that you'll be doing, uh, where, where can we collectively follow this? Mm -hmm. Where can we find you? Yes, so here you'll find my website, nugensmith.com. Um, here is my Instagram as well, at Perfect. Bundle House. Um, and then I also have uh, these cards here that has uh, the gallery information uh, that I'm working with. And I um, can give you these and pass them out. Thank you. And that way you can get on the gallery's email list and they send out a blast of updates when I'm doing things. Awesome, okay. I don't have a question or anything, but I just want to say I'm very glad that I came today. I learned a lot from you and your discussions and uh, I really appreciate everything that you shared with us, especially your uh, experiences growing up and coming here to America as an immigrant in all the different countries that you've been to and that you're still looking forward to going to. Yeah, um, I did have a question about those pieces there. Did you say they're prototypes of larger pieces? Yes, yes. Yeah, so I'm, um, so these sculptures uh, the bundle house sculptures. I am. <clears throat> I'm thinking about. Uh, I, I have like when we go back to this idea of like playfulness. I think about these sometimes. A friend of mine said to me, "He's like, hey, they look like toys. You know, like bundle house for bo all your boys and girls." Yeah. Like, you know? So, yeah. I, so I also think about this idea of these objects having this element of playfulness. And what if I can stem into that? Um, that realm of creating objects that others can interact with. 
So I want to create these objects that um, when someone buys them, they can then kind of structure and create the bundle house using the pieces I provide in the way that they would like to. And then they're multi-use, so thinking about them like you could put a little tea candle here, <laughs> you know, put it down and then there's light in the bundle house. Mm -hmm. um, so these are prototypes for the different types of um, ways that they can be constructed. And perhaps if I want to do them um, in, in mass, I can say, okay, I'm, this, is the, this is the prototype for the roof. Mm -hmm. Let's make 50 of these, mm -hmm. right? And it's fairly simple to construct, in, you know? So these are uh, tests, prototypes for those. I love your incorporation of the soils, picking up soils from different places. It reminds me a lot of, uh, I'm sorry, but I can't TED Talks, and he has all these jars of soil of men and women and African Americans that have been lynched in America. Yes, I'm very appreciate you sharing your collection of soils and how they're incorporated in your art. Um, I would like to ask you, have you been any uh, artists that have influenced your work at all, and you, especially in your collage work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the collage work, um, Definitely uh, Romir Bearden, when I first started, it was a huge impact um, on me in, in terms of collage. Um, also, to uh, in terms of collage work, um, and, and going back to like sculptural forms too, I'll include them in there. Um, uh, Clay's Oldenburg, um, with his soft sculptures, the way that he created these massive everyday objects. Um, a John Otterbridge, uses a lot of found materials in the work. Um, the Sars, Betty Sar, Allison Sar, um, they're definitely in terms of like thinking about the spirit in work, in art, and using found material, making assemblage, um, thinking about the future and the possibility of dreams and space. Uh, mm -hmm. So these are some of the influences. Yeah. I'm really glad um, Brown and Sculpt has brought you here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you guys so much.